Welcome to our final episode of Novara Live before the general election. Yes, the next time you see me, it will be tomorrow at half nine p.m. for our election sesh. We're incredibly excited. Um, lots to talk about, though, on the eve of the election. And to do so, um, I'm delighted to be joined by Dahlia Gabriel. Dahlia, how are you doing? I am flagging post Glastonbury. I am like, I was not made to be outside for that long. So I'm going to try and make it through this show. And I will also be seeing a lot of our viewers tomorrow evening for our all night election sesh. Got another late night uh, ahead of you, um, Dahlia. So try to save some energy um, from this evening's uh, show. The Tories have spent the last day of their campaign admitting they've already lost. And it seems begging for sympathy. This was Work and Pension Secretary Mel Stride speaking to Times Radio. We're on the, uh, the, the brink, probably, of the largest landslide we will have ever seen in this country, larger than 97, larger than the national government in mm. 1931. And we have to therefore ask this question about what kind of opposition are we going to have? And that's why people should be really taking a really careful look now before they cast their vote tomorrow at supporting the Conservative Party so we can hold this government uh, to account uh, going forward. And can I just make one other point, Asper, which mm. is there are many uh, excellent Conservative MPs and candidates up and down the country. Some people are looking for change. We are going to get change tomorrow. Those polls, unless it's an extraordinary um, uh, upset, which yeah. is highly, highly unlikely, you're going to get a Labour government. You get the change. Think about the local candidate. Think about MPs that have worked very hard, Conservative MPs in the past, to stand up for their communities. You're going to need them to be there going forward in the years to come. So I think this is completely unprecedented, not just one of the two major parties, but the party of government, a minister saying, we're going to lose. The Conservatives are going to lose. The Labour Party are going to win. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to worry that if you, you vote for us, we might be in power because we're going to lose anyway. Uh, but maybe you like your local MP. Like, this is really, really desperate stuff. For his part, Rishi Sunak spent the morning on ITV's This Morning. Um, he appeared alongside Britain's most tattooed mum. Um, you can see him in the back right there. The tattooed mum is in the foreground. Um, highlights of the interview included Sunak telling the programme that, quote, well, my favourite meal generally is sandwiches. You know, I'm a big sandwich person. Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson were, of course, fined during the COVID pandemic for enjoying some birthday sandwiches. And Boris Johnson was out and about again last night, making his first appearance on the campaign trail. If these polls are right, then at the very moment when this country has beaten COVID and beaten post-COVID inflation, at the very moment when we should be encouraging enterprise and growth and putting some money into and home ownership and putting some money into people's pockets, Westminster is about to go in diametrically the opposite direction. And so none of us can sit back as a Labour government prepares to use a sledgehammer majority to destroy so much of what we have achieved. Obviously talking complete um, nonsense, um, all that we have achieved over the past five years, the reason um, that Labour are going to do very well in this general election is because people don't think the Conservatives have achieved very much over the past five years. Um, lots of people, though, noting um, that Boris Johnson did get a fairly sort of rapturous welcome from those Conservative Party activists, clearly capable of inspiring just a little bit more enthusiasm than Rishi Sunak. Um, as you would imagine, though, Boris Johnson's appearance has been dismissed by Keir Starmer. I've been arguing that the four, last 14 years have been about chaos and division. And last night they wheeled out the architect of chaos and division. So uh, I think that just shows the sort of desperate negative place they've got to in their campaign. I'm proud, by contrast, that our campaign from start to finish has been positive, has been confident, and has been about the change that we need in our country. Whether it's Boris Johnson, whether it's Liz Truss, whether it's David Cameron or Rishi Sunak, all you're going to get with them is more of the same. Keir Starmer might like to claim his campaign has been positive, but Labour are in the somewhat odd position of being set for a massive landslide majority, but with historically low levels 
of enthusiasm. So analysis by the Financial Times shows that Labour voters are less enthusiastic about the party this year than in any recent election and less than Conservative voters were about the Tories in 2019. And according to YouGov, a full 48% of people give us their number one reason for voting Labour to get the Tories out. Um, The country needs a change, comes in second at 13%. I agree with their policies is a distant third on 5% of Labour voters. Of course, it's this desire to kick out the Tories, which means their leaders have resorted to reassuring the public that however you vote, we'll lose anyway, so don't worry about it. But Keir Starmer today has tried to push back against that message. We need to be clear with them that if they don't vote for change, if we don't get a Labour government, we could end up with more of the same on Friday morning. And we do have to say, imagine waking up on Friday morning and the headline is five more years of the Tories. Nothing's changed. They'll be emboldened, entitled, thinking they can get away with anything. So we have to make that case. We have to say over and over again, change only happens if you vote for it. There is at this point pretty much a zero chance that people will wake up on Friday morning with a Tory government, which might explain why The Sun has finally come out for Labour. The Murdoch-owned paper has famously never backed the losing side at a general election. And they've come out saying, as Britain goes to the polls, it's time for a new manager. They say in brackets, and we don't mean sack Southgate. The Evening Standard, owned by the son of an oligarch, Evgeny Lebedev, um, has also today backed Labour. Um, Lebedev was controversially given a peerage by Boris Johnson in 2020, but the press baron has apparently decided it's time to switch his allegiances. Um, Dahlia, final day of campaigning before a general election, and you've got the party of government saying don't worry, you can vote for us because we're going to lose anyway. This is really, really unprecedented, isn't it? It is unprecedented. What's also unprecedented is the fact that such a significant majority is on the cards for a political party, the Labour Party. Meanwhile, the leader of that Labour Party, the face of that party, is so deeply unpopular This is very uncharted territory. This is very, it's a very strange historical moment that we don't really have precedence for. You know, Tony Blair is not a popular name anymore, but no one can deny that in 1997, when the Labour Party was elected on a historic landslide, yes, a big part of it was because of fatigue with conservative rule, but also a big part of it was because Tony Blair did seem to offer a positive, he offered a strong vision, at least. He offered a vision um, that did seem to divert politically from what had um, currently existed. Now, of course, what he went on to do um, was murder a million Iraqis and make the uh, welfare state in Britain extremely vulnerable to austerity and privatization. But at least in the moment of 1997, people weren't just voting against something, they felt like they were voting for something. Whereas at this moment, it feels like people are voting in spite of something. Um, And whilst it is certainly uh, very reassuring in some senses to know that the Conservative Party is going to get severely punished for what they have put people in this country through over the past decade, it is, you know, it is they certainly deserve it. Uh, I think any any party that subjects the people people of any country to what the Conservative Party have subjected us to do deserve to get smashed into smithereens at the poll. They deserve to get humiliated. But I think the issue, you know, we're very focused on what happens tomorrow. What will be very interesting, of course, is what happens over the next five years. Keir Starmer is not popular with the people. He is not popular with the press, particularly. But also, I think there's a very interesting, you know, we're looking at the rest of Europe right now, where we have seen the sort of centrist technocrats, um, you know, being selected in the face, in in opposition against a more far right figure or a failing right wing figure, and then spending the years that they are elected, paving the way for the resurgence of that far right in an ever more cohesive form. And to me, that is the most worrying thing about the prospect of not just a Labour Party landslide, but a Labour Party landslide under Keir Starmer. Because if you read between the lines on that Sun paper, uh, you know, the Sun to me is a far-right paper 
um, for sure. That language of we need a new manager is so interesting to me because it reminds me of this statement that David Graeber made which is that the state, the character of the British state is inherently conservative. It inherently belongs not just to little c conservative people, but to the conservative party and its interests. And the only time that Labour is able to get into power and is able to govern is when the conservative party are in a state of crisis and they need to regroup. And it's so interesting that that concept of Keir Starmer is there, you know, is being anointed as a temporary interim manager of the interests of British capital um, is is so it, it kind of it accidentally echoes that theory that David Graeber poses. And my concern is in the process of continuing this managed decline of the welfare state, this managed decline of, you know, Britain as a society that is livable for anyone but the very, very rich. My concern is that over that five years, what kind of right-wing force is going to be cultivated, ready to take power when Keir Starmer's party inevitably fails to inspire people or address the core issues that people are facing in their everyday life? So whilst I am Looking forward to seeing conservatives crying on my TV screen. There will be certainly a cathartic release to that. I must say I'm extremely concerned about what five years of this Starmer Labour Party is going to culminate in in the next five years, particularly as many of those core economic climate issues um, are only going to get worse over the next five years. Um, uh, I've got an interview in a moment sort of with someone who's somewhat sceptical about Labour's plans to bring about growth. I think that will be key in terms of whether they can sort of keep the population on side. Um, uh, before we move on to that, let's look at where the polls currently stand. Um, the whole sort of introduction to our show has been based on the premise that Labour are a dead cert to win this election. Um, but by quite how much is still you know, to some degree up for debate. This is the BBC's poll aggregator showing um, the latest vote intentions. Um, Labour on 39%, which is, you know, a high number, but not extraordinary. What is extraordinary is the Conservatives being down on 21%. Of course, um, that's because much of their vote has been eaten up by Reform UK, who are on 16. Um, The latest poll tracker has the Lib Dems on 11%, the Greens on 6%, the SNP on 3%, and Plaid Cymru on 1%. Of course, SNP and implied only stand in their respective nations so it doesn't make much sense to sort of talk about them on a on a, on a UK wide polling tracker but it's the conservatives on 21% here which is the really sort of historic um thing to point out i think um as for how this could play out in terms of seats we can look at the various mrp projections um from the major pollsters um more in common have this so they predict um, that Labour will win 430 seats, um, up 228 seats on the past election, so more than doubling the number of seats. Um, they see the Conservatives as being on 126 seats, um, which would be the worst defeat in Tory party history. Um, they have the Lib Dems on 52, SNP on 15. Reform UK on only two. Now, if Reform UK only win two seats on the back of, say, 15% of the vote, then that will sort of, I think, supercharge the call for electoral reform. The Greens on one here. Now, I think this is the pulse which gives the Tories the most and the Greens the least. Let's look at Servation. Um, so Servation um, has Labour on 484 and the Conservatives on 64. So uh, this would be extraordinary. Um, they have the Lib Dems on 61, so just three seats behind the Tories. So, you know, close um, to the Lib Dems becoming the official opposition. And um, they've got reform on seven, the SNP on 10, Plaid Cymru on three, and the Greens on three. I really do hope the Greens win at least three seats. Um, and finally, the YouGov MRP has Labour on 431, the Conservatives on 102, and the Lib Dems on 72, the SNP on 18, Reform UK on three, Plaid on three, and the Greens on two. Um, for context, In the 1997 Labour landslide, the party won 418 seats to the Tories, 165. So every single one of these MRPs has the Tories performing way worse than they did in 1997, which is always sort of pointed to as the biggest landslide of our 
uh, of my lifetime at least. Um, Dahlia, what will you be looking out for when it comes to these results? I think, you know, everyone now has accepted that the Labour Party are going to win. Um, various issues. How big will their majority be? How small will the Tories number of seats be? How many will the Greens get? What are you sort of most um, keen to to find out when that exit poll comes out and then as the results come through during the night? I think that for me, and I'm not sure if this is something that we're going to figure out on election day, because I think it's very much about where the chips will fall in the kind of months and years after. But the question that I am most interested in is who will be the opposition? Who will be the official leader of the opposition and who will be the de facto um, opposition? Because I think there's this, been this very interesting, obviously, dynamic where the Conservative Party is succumbing to the weight of the, its internal contradiction. You know, it's not just about bad governance, although the, bad, the terrible governance that we have seen from the Conservative Party over the ten, past 10 years is obviously a significant factor why this is happening. But it's also the Conservatives are collapsing under the weight of this contradiction between the kind of neoliberal globalization wing of the party, the David Camerons, and the, you know, Little England nativist kind of Faragist um, side of the party. So it kind of needs to resolve some of those internal contradictions. And that's also why it's it's so weak. Um, and, you know, they are most likely going to be the second largest party in terms of seats. But we then also have this dynamic of potentially, uh, you know, when it comes to raw numbers um, and raw percentage points, that Reform UK might emerge as the de facto voice of the opposition. And a big reason why that might also happen is because Reform UK, UKIP, the Brexit party, whatever you want to call the latest surrogate vehicle for Nigel Farage's political project and his ego, you can the, the reason that they are in this extremely strong position is because they have been relentlessly pushed by the media in a way that is not commensurate with the actual organic popularity of the party. Every election cycle, we go through the same rigmarole. We go through, you know, Nigel Farage and his wealthy backers pouring all of their resources, all of their time, all of this media capital into targeting a single seat and inevitably failing to eat to win that seat. So, you know, it's happened. It goes through every cycle, this kind of hype, hype, hype that Nigel Farage is going to be an MP. And then it ends up fizzling out. Um, that probably is not going to happen this time. You know, I think fourth, fifth times a charm. But it's interesting that despite the fact that he is a loser in many ways, him and his parties are losers in many ways, the amount of positive coverage that they get, the way in which Nigel Farage is the de facto opposition voice in the two-party system is something that has been cultivated by political figures and by the media. A very interesting study by Loughborough University found that um, Reform UK during this election cycle has received the most positive coverage of any party in British politics today. We see the fact that parties like the Green Party by, when we look at the data, the Green Party is more successful than any of Nigel Farage's surrogate vehicles. They have an MP. They have lots of councillors. They are, in many ways, the kind of of the small parties on paper, the ones with the most political legitimacy. And yet they don't receive any of the kind of coverage and any of the kind of bolstering that Nigel Farage um Produces. So it looks like he is finally going to achieve his lifelong goal after however many years of actually becoming a Brit an, an MP, a British MP. And we have to understand that the, 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 that level of power that he has gained is a project of the media. And that's why I'm very interested to see over the next few years as the Conservative Party, you know, recoups itself, has to figure out what direction is it going to go in. That I have a sense that Nigel Farage in a totally engineered and produced way, is going to become the de facto voice of the opposition to the Labour Party. And that is something that Keir Starmer is probably very happy about, because if Keir Starmer wants to be triangulated in any direction, he wants to be triangulated for, um, by the far right. And that's probably why he told his Labour candidate, Jovan Owusu-Napal, to stop campaigning in Nigel Farage's seat, because to him, 
Nigel Farage being the de facto voice of the opposition, Nigel Farage being an MP is much more amenable to his political project than, say, the Green Party becoming you know, the, 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 the pressure point that is pulling him towards the left. It was interesting he pull, pulled away that MP, wasn't it? So if, uh, the reporting on it suggested that he thought, not MP, sorry, the candidate, that he thought the young candidate standing up against Nigel Farage was getting too much media coverage and he didn't like that. So they sent him elsewhere. Um, I, I see where you're coming from the media. I do also think there is genuinely, you know, it's not majority support for reform, but I think there is some organic support for that kind of politics. I don't think it's, you know, that there are many people in the country who want migration to be reduced. Like, we might disagree with them, but they exist. I don't think it's a completely sort of concocted um, political movement. Um, do you think he should just be ignored? I mean, he's way above the Greens in the polls, for example. Um, it'd be interesting to see how this election would have panned out. Did we not have opinion polls? But we do have opinion polls. Um, and clearly reform are the third most popular party in, in, in the country. So how should the media respond? Should they just ignore the guy? Well, I think the the kind of the, the history that I'm looking at is not because right now, yes, absolutely. The, the polls do show him to be this very popular figure. But what I'm saying is that for someone of his, you know, when we look at the actual support that he had, say, 10 years ago, um, the amount of media retention of positive media attention, media attention that was very geared towards portraying him as the only option for people who are dissatisfied with the two party system, with people who are dissatisfied with both the Conservatives and the Labour Party, which is frankly like most people. The fact that he has been so heavily pushed and cultivated has restricted the imagination of the British public into believing that the only way that you can dissent from the Labour and the from Labour and the Conservative Party, both of whom have significantly failed the British people, is through this far right nationalist anti-immigration rhetoric. They have conflated they, the amount of airtime and the amount of positive heroization of Nigel Farage that has taken place over the past 10, 15 years has culminated in this moment that now has translated into genuine support because I'm uh, the the reason that I say that is because I wonder if Caroline Lucas, who actually was an MP, you know, who actually was voted in, and therefore, if we live in a democracy, should be considered to be more representative of a section of, of of British the British political spectrum than Nigel Farage, who routinely failed to win elections. If she got the same level over the t- past ten years, the same level of positive media representation of media platforms, the ability to articulate her positions in an uninterrupted and and repetitive way, we could be living in a very different climate right now. But the, the lesson that we know from the past 100 years is that under capitalism, under social democracy, the outright, a far right outrider is far more amenable to British capital, to the interests of the powerful than a far left outrider. Nigel Farage is an acceptable and legitimate opposition in the eyes of these people. Caroline Lucas and anyone who kind of, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, anyone who represents something to the left of the Labour Party is seen as even when they win huge democratic mandates or at least, you know, bigger democratic mandates in the far right are treated like you know, irritations as kind of mistakes and threats that need to be swiftly eliminated, or they are just completely ignored and treated as if they don't exist. Throughout this campaign, Keir Starmer and Labour have answered difficult questions about tough choices by saying one thing. They think that Britain's days of high growth are over, but they're not. Labour will get Britain growing again. Now, it's been less clear how, without raising taxes or borrowing, Labour will make that growth happen. But when you look beneath the surface, the gamble Labour are making becomes clearer. Labour is banking on billions of pounds of private investment flooding the country after the general election. Now, we've talked about this this Bloomberg piece before on Monday, show, but it's worth um, going over some of the key details Again, so they say Rachel Reeves has for months been working to spark investors' interest in projects that are central to Labour's manifesto 
people familiar with the matter said. Areas of focus include the push into green energy, ramping up house building, and improving public transport and the roads. The plan involves creating new financial instruments to stimulate demand from institutional investors, as well as considering how the government can take on some of the risk of private investments in key projects, according to the people who requested anonymity discussing plans for after next week's election. The people declined to detail the specific investments they are expected to announce. Um, so saying, we don't have much money, we're not going to increase taxes, we're not going to increase borrowing, but what we're going to do is work to spark investors' interests in projects central to Labour's manifesto, including um, green energy, house building, and the like. Um, so who are these private investors? Well, later in the article, um, Bloomberg specifies this. Private sector money is likely to mainly come from big UK banks through syndicated loans, insurers and pension funds, with Labour holding talks with the likes of HSBC and BlackRock on investing in skills to retrofit homes with insulation and other energy-saving measures, as well as ways to make affordable housing viable for developers across the country. One Labour official joked that the party would be getting BlackRock to rebuild Britain. Now, BlackRock is the world's biggest asset manager controlling 10 trillion dollars in funds. So is relying on this kind of private finance to rebuild Britain a good idea? What would a Labour government have to promise the likes of BlackRock to entice them to invest in Britain? And what might the British public gain or lose in return? Now, one person who thinks this could all end badly is Daniela Gabor. She's Professor of Economics and Macro Finance at the University of the West of England. And she's argued in The Guardian that handing vital infrastructure to private investment companies will generate windfalls for investors and leave the rest of us worse off. Um, it's a very interesting piece. And I caught up with Daniela Gabor earlier today. I began by asking her why Labour would say um, that it's right to rely on these private investors to fund infrastructure projects. The story that Labour uh, is telling is a story about where can you go with investment with, with investment if you don't have the public cash that is necessary uh, for restoring at least the infrastructure that is, has been decimated by years of austerity. And the idea is if you if you can't issue more debt because interest rates are high, if you can't if you don't want to raise taxes, um, if you don't want to have austerity, then the, the, the only answer you have is uh, to try to mobilize private investment in infrastructure to try to get BlackRock or Blackstone or any other large asset manager or, or private equity fund to come and, and invest in Britain. As far as I understand, that would mean sort of encouraging the likes of BlackRock to come and build some roads, you know, sort of like basic infrastructure. And I suppose what's confusing for me to understand, and I'm sure our audience as well, is if a private company comes and builds a road, um, how do they get any money back from that? I suppose unless the road has sort of toll booths on the end of it. Are we talking about roads with toll booths or are they going to get paid back in a different way? Of course, every bit of, uh, of infrastructure is different and ways to generate revenue from every bit of infrastructure will be different. But the story that BlackRock is telling uh, the uh, Labour Party, and it's a story that BlackRock is telling not just the Labour Party in Britain, but it's, it's telling the same story to every government in uh, Europe, to governments in the United States, to governments in the, uh, in the Global South. Uh, Larry Fink, its president, uh, the president of BlackRock, was the only... Uh, private financier present at the G7 table last month in uh, Italy. And the idea is because you don't, you need growth. Uh, uh, most countries need, need growth in order to deal with high public debt. Uh, you can get this growth through infrastructure investment. And because you don't have uh, uh, enough fiscal resources to do infrastructure investment, we will do it for you or with you. And I think this idea of with you is very important. It's a public-private partnership. And Larry Fink, the president of BlackRock, always says the same words. We need to be partners. We need a public-private partnership. And the, the reason why partnership is so important to this um, to the way in which the uh, Labour Party is thinking about mobilizing private investment is that these investors, these asset managers, 
what they require is a steady cash flow, is a, a steady revenue from their investments. And these steady revenues, in the, the case of, uh, of a road, this is, this is very clearly demonstrated in, demonstrated in many countries in the global south. It comes from tolls, of course. Uh, in the case of hospitals it could, uh, it, that are built in public-private partnerships, it can come either from contracts that the government will sign with a BlackRock or with any other uh, private investors that, that agrees on a distribution of risks that protects or enhances the returns of these private investors. So that's why uh, when, when one talks about, when private finance talks about partnerships with the government, we know that what they mean is we want to own these assets. Uh, we think about how to make these uh, uh, roads or education or health, how to make it investable. And by, the, by, by investable, they mean how do we make uh, returns uh, adequate for what our shareholders or what our uh, own uh, investors uh, expect. Because we have to remember, and this is, I guess, guess, one of the great ironies of 40 years of neoliberalism, is that BlackRock is basically uh, uh, managing the uh, money of the pension funds to which we contribute. And they have to promise this pension fund significant returns, returns that are higher than uh, uh, what pension funds would get if they just held government bonds. So in the end, somebody has to pay. It's either us, the taxpayer, if we pay uh, for uh, toll, tolls on highways, or it will be as the taxpayer through uh, fiscal resources if the government promises to compensate investors if some um, risks materialize. I suppose there's two issues. So one is sort of de-risking. So sort of if, if something goes wrong, the government will will sort of pay or, or back it up. So the other is, so my understanding of private finance initiatives, which are very big under New Labour, was essentially instead of the state building hospital, we say, you private company, can you build the hospital? And then what we'll do is we'll promise to rent it back from you um, for you know potentially an inflated price, but for a set price, let's say, over a long, a long period of time. So, is this just PFI sort of rebooted? Is that what we're talking about, or is is there something different about what Labour are proposing now? It is, in a sense, it is a PFI rebooted because it has the same kind of logic of the state has to, one way or another, generate revenues for uh, the private sector in order to deliver public goods to the British people. But I think it's bigger than PFIs because we have to remember most PFIs end up. Uh, being or the assets that the private contractors have built uh, in PFIs will uh, be returned to the public sector. And we know, I encourage your readers to look at the Financial Times or, or the Office for National Audit reports on, on the legal, legal problems and litigations that uh, this return involves, because of course, private contractors have an incentive to run down these assets, to invest less and less before they return it to the state to maximize profits. But I think there is something bigger at play in the sense that BlackRock or Blackstone or any other large uh, uh, fund that is looking to invest in infrastructure as a form of uh, a, a steady and significant revenue, it wants to own these assets. We know, for example, that in the US, the, through the Inflation Reduction Act, um, most private investors in green energy are getting very, very nice revenues from it. And Blackstone, for example, is one of the largest, the private equity fund that we all know as the global uh, institutional landlord because it owns more and more houses that it rents um, uh, across Europe and across the, the United States. Uh, Black, Blackstone is now the owner of uh, one of the largest uh, uh, green energy companies in the United States. And for what is at stake for these private investors is their ability to put more and more infrastructure into their portfolios, to own them, uh, to own this infrastructure and to ge generate revenues from it. So my concern is not only that it will privatize public goods, that it will reduce uh, access to these public goods, or it will make it conditional on our ability to pay. But my, my concern is that in some ways, this also means it ties the hands of the state. And what I say in, in the, the Guardian article is that we have to think about what kind of a state project does a, a Labour Party in power propose to the British public when it says, I want BlackRock to rebuild Britain. And my worry is that this is a state project in which Britain or the British government is building uh, uh, Britain for BlackRock in the sense that it's allowing financial institutions like BlackRock to become increasingly uh, mediators in the social contract between the state and its citizens. And that means that in the future, when we want to make different kinds of 
climate policies, when we want to make different kinds of infra, uh, uh, welfare policies, we have to run against the political power of BlackRock. We have to run against their ability to say, look, we own the infrastructure. If you want to, to do things differently, well, either you have to buy us out, you have to nationalize, and we know in Britain how difficult it is to nationalize. Some previous Labour Party um, uh, uh, Officials have promised uh, nationalization now that's not on the cards anymore. And that's where the danger is that it, in a sense, BlackRock is occupying the kind of state transformative state projects that we see progressive uh, parties and progressive governments thinking about. And that is, and I'm supposing we will get to this in a second, that to my mind is in a sense uh, the biggest challenge of a, any progressive government is to say, to think about is the, uh, if we want to do something that transforms our economies or that transforms our infrastructures, and we have to ask ourselves, how do we pay for it? Why is it that the answer inevitably is BlackRock rather than something else? What would that something else be? Because I suppose uh, maybe a counter to sort of your critique of this model is, and, and what I assume Labour would say is, look, th this might not be the ideal way to do it, but it's the the only way to do it. BlackRock has $10 trillion. Um, we might as well be encouraging them to to put that into wind turbines and solar panels and um, high speed rail instead of putting it into something more more damaging, perhaps or, or less socially valuable. That's exactly what the Labour Party uh, um, would say uh, uh, in defence of their uh, suggestion that we have to get BlackRock to to invest in Britain, and that's that's a, a, a in a sense. We have to remember that BlackRock is offering parties like Labour or governments uh, of other countries, is offering them a plausible narrative of how you can do things differently without changing very much in the institutional architecture. So it's a kind of, we stay within the status quo of the institutions that neoliberalism built for us, and I'll come to that in a second, but you can promise transformative visions, you can articulate transformative visions. And to my mind, of course, that's that's, that's true in the sense that if you want, don't want to change very much in the way that the uh, institutions of macroeconomic policy in Britain operate, if you want to remain within uh, the inflation targeting framework that you have, if you want to remain, to, if you are reluctant to try to roll back the power of uh, global finance, then the only alternative that you have plausibly is to say, of course, we will mobilize private capital. We will get BlackRock to come and we hopefully will have very good lawyers and these lawyers will negotiate the risking contracts in which the real, real allocation of risks from the private sector to the public sector will be done in a way that doesn't really harm the British taxpayer that much. You know, all the kind of nice uh, kind of fantasies that I suppose, and I'm, I'm not so reluctant to call them fantasies because the distribution of power in these contracts is very much uh, benefiting the, the private finance rather than, than the government. But we have to think, if we take a step, step back and think, what are the kind of challenges that uh, Britain or any other country is facing in 2024 and, and, and ahead? It's a, the, the, the challenge of the climate, climate crisis is very significant to me. And you can't address the challenge of the climate crisis by staying within this institutional status quo in which you know, the central bank is uh, a technocratic force outside the, the democratic politics. The fiscal authority is tied uh, in, in its ability to do things by both the central bank and by the forces of global finance, where we have very large pension funds that uh, are basically increasing the power of BlackRock to enter partnerships with governments. So if you stay within these, you you won't be able to change very much. And then, of course, BlackRock is the only plausible political narrative that you can offer. And you kind of put aside the distributional and structural consequences. But what I've been suggesting for a while now, and I've been working on thinking about, uh, thinking through the politics for this is, what would what would a state look like if we took seriously the idea that we can't address the climate crisis through private finance? And I'm very convinced we can't. And to me, we have to think, start to think very seriously about a big green state. It was easier to do that five, five years ago, three years ago, uh, when both central banks and uh, politicians were willing to accept that the, the current organization of the relationship between the central bank and uh, the, the treasury is one in which is one that doesn't work very well for for the for pandemics or for situations of profound crisis and a big green state would say look we need the state to do a lot more because the the private sector can't it simply cannot function with the kind of shocks that 
we are looking at over the course of the climate crisis. And that requires, uh, of course, and I accept the politics of, of profound institutional change is not here for now in the sense that you need political ambition. Uh, you need to, to have control in some ways over uh, the, your um, uh, political process. And if Labour wins with a very significant majority, then some of the conditions would be met. And then you, you need to do two important things. You, you need to start thinking about changing the relationship between the central bank and the, and the treasury. I think this is fundamental. People, people sometimes uh, put this aside because it's a kind of technical macroeconomic issue, but we want to think about how do we organize the institutions of money creation and of credit, private credit creation in a way that benefits the public good rather than benefits uh, private finance and, and global finance. So that's one thing. Uh, a closer relationship between uh, the Treasury and uh, the Bank of England or any uh, any central bank in, in other countries. And the second uh, plank of this big green state would be to roll back the power of global finance to try to shrink its footprint, to, shr to shrink the footprint of BlackRock and of private equity in our lives. And this is not such an extraordinary thing to think of. F Ten years ago, after the global financial crisis, when everybody was committed to making finance a bit less disruptive for our lives, we used to talk about shrinking uh, shadow banking. We used to call institutions like BlackRock and shadow banks. And th th that political imaginary is not so far distant in the past. It was there 10 years ago. But of course, it requires confronting and, and, and taking on very, very significant political forces, both domestic in the sense of conservative central banks in the conservative economies and uh, global forces in the sense of uh, the, the, the infrastructural and structural uh, power that uh, BlackRock and other uh, large financial institutions have. So it, it's, a, it's a big challenge. And then, of course, once you resolve that, you also have to think about how do you create state capacity? But no, nobody said politics is easy in the, in the age of climate uh, crisis. Praful Nargund is Labour's candidate for Islington North. Yes, that's the seat that Jeremy Corbyn has held for more than 40 years until the Labour Party expelled him. Now, Corbyn is obviously standing as an independent, and we know a lot about his record on apartheid, on Palestine, on public services. But what do we know about Praful Nargund? Well, the Labour candidate has been famously cagey, giving few interviews while reportedly refusing to attend hustings and debates. The only thing people really know about the 33-year-old is that he's rich. Very rich. But now an investigation by Navarra Media can, for the first time, reveal an assessment of that wealth and the links between Nargan's wealth and private healthcare. In 2000, Nargan's mother Gita, a consultant, founded Create Fertility, a private company offering reproductive assistance treatment like IVF and egg freezing. By 2015, it had eight clinics and Prafal Nargund was its managing director. Then in 2017, they started a second line of 16 clinics. This one was called ABC IVF, offering low cost fertility treatments across England and Wales. Now, obviously, private healthcare, very controversial on the left. In fact, I've got nothing in theory against a company offering low-cost IVF and egg freezing. Like Egg freezing, very important, very useful as people want to have babies as they get older. And you can only get your eggs frozen on the NHS if you've had treatment that affects your fertility, for example, chemotherapy. So I think if someone else wants to offer that service at a reasonable cost, that's fine. Only a good thing, in fact. However, if an MP has large business interests, they should be scrutinized, especially if it's in a crucial sector like healthcare, a sector that has lots of relationships with the state and with the government. And on this point, Nargan's business interests are complex, to say the least. Um, Stephen Meffen reports, in the intervening years and those that followed, the Nargans constructed a complex corporate structure around Create Fertility. It was operated by a company called Create Health Limited that in turn was owned by a holding company called Create Health Holding, which was itself owned for a while by Create Health Global. Later, a further company, New Spring Holdings, was formed. With the exception of Create Health Limited, Prafal Nargand was director of each. Such a structure in which companies are related by ownership is called a group. Under UK tax laws, companies in groups can obtain tax advantages. If one company is particularly profitable, it offsets, it can offset its tax burden against another in the group suffering losses. Um, create Fertility, it's important to note, was very profitable. 
Not only that, it secured NHS contracts across the UK, meaning that NHS trusts paid the clinics to provide fertility treatment for NHS patients. And Nagan's wealth is also tied up in international financial capital. In 2021, the Nargans sold Create Fertility to US Spanish private healthcare giant IVIRMA. Um, At the time, IVIRMA was the world's largest provider of reproductive medical treatment. But that wasn't the last time um, Create Fertility was sold. And the article goes on to say this. In a sign of the high value placed on the fertility market by global capital, in 2023, IVIRMA was in turn acquired by KKR. That's a US-based global private equity and investment firm. That was for 3 billion euros. As a result, KKR became the overarching owner of the Nargans clinics. It also became the direct beneficiary of NHS outsourcing tariffs paid to create fertility clinics to provide treatment to NHS patients. KKR is no stranger to capitalizing healthcare. Its portfolio boasts a range of international holdings in the private healthcare field, including private health insurance firms, pharmaceutical companies, and private medical treatment providers. Um, Now, those sales uh, mean, of course, that Nargand has been directly implicated in involving international private equity in Britain's healthcare system. Um, And the Nargands appear to have made a tidy sum from this process. Um, Let's go back to Stephen's report. Um, So they say, um, the proceeds of the sale of by the Nargans of Create Fertility to IVI RMA Global have never been disclosed, nor have the proceeds received by the Nargans of the later sale of IVI RMA to KKR. But calculations by Navarra Media, based on publicly available documents involving the several holding companies used to facilitate the sales, indicate that the Nargans could have profited to the tune of £60 million. As Prafal's share in the separate holding company, which ultimately owned Create Fertility, was 12.5%, this suggests that he personally netted 7.5 7.5 million pounds. Um, according to the most recent records of yet another holding company, the Nargans continued to own around 3.5% of the company, giving Profil a personal stake of around 0.5%. Now, while that may initially seem insignificant, the business is worth many millions of pounds and operates in an area of private healthcare likely to grow exponentially in the coming years. Um, now, it's important to note um, there's no suggestion. Um, that Prafal and Gita acted improperly in the sales of their clinics. Um, no laws have been broken. Um, the question I suppose this though poses, and I'll pose this to you, Dahlia, um, could this create conflicts of interest for a Labour MP? If you've got someone who's, who's got lots of money tied up in private healthcare. Now, as I say, I don't think there's anything wrong with sort of providing cheap egg freezing services. But if you've got lots of money tied up with private healthcare, which is then also very much related to international um, sort of uh, investment vehicles, um, might there be a conflict of interest if if you want to sort of become a uh, become an MP, maybe join government even? So first of all, thank you. I just want to really big up Stephen for that incredible reporting. I think it's so important, especially over the next five years, that we have journalists and researchers like Stephen who are doing this kind of work. When it comes to the question of conflict of interest, This reminds me of when Akshata Murthy, who is Rishi Sunak's billionaire wife, uh, got into some hot water because she was found to have failed to declare um, her investment in a childcare platform company, Koru Kids. And this was a company that had benefited from directly from childcare subsidies um, by the government as part of a sort of broader trend under the Conservative government to defund publicly available healthcare and to instead uh, reroute that funding that would have gone to direct provision into sort of cash handouts that then um, parents pay to private providers. So it's a, like a nifty little way in which taxpayer money, state money um, gets funneled into um, pr- the private sector through the apex of a care crisis. So it reminds me a lot of, of this kind of, um, of that scandal. It's pretty much the same sort of issues thrown up at hand. And I wrote an article at the time for The Guardian when that, um, when that scandal came, uh, that scandal surfaced. And what I said in that, and what I think is still true um, for Nargund as well, is that when we're talking about things like conflicts of interest, particularly when it comes to privatizing services um, that have been gutted by um, by austerity, um, that it's not just about one person and one company or one politician and one company that they might be involved in, but it's about a shared structural and class interest between politicians 
who implement austerity, whether it's, you know, active direct austerity or real terms austerity, which is what we're probably going to get with Starmer's government, the shared class interest between those politicians that implement that kind of austerity politics and the market forces that exploit the gaps and vulnerabilities that are created by that underfunding or defunding from the state. And so what we are seeing here is a removal of MPs like Jeremy Corbyn, um, who represent someone who is ideologically invested in the idea of a public welfare system, of a public healthcare system, with someone who cl- shares a class interest with people who seek to gain from the privatization of those healthcare and care services. And I have to say, I really strongly actually disagree with you, Michael, that it's fine to have um, private providers, you know, that it, it's somehow that this is somehow like an acceptable way of having reproductive health care um, disseminated. Because I understand that there is a sense of like, well, look, this is not a healthcare service that is available in the NHS. So if there's a company that can provide it affordably, then that's a good thing. But ultimately, when we start to make these kinds of concessions, then where do we draw the line about whether or not a healthcare service, it is acceptable for that healthcare service to not be on the NHS? Because to me, reproductive health care, reproductive rights, whether it's for queer couples, same-sex couples, people who are struggling with fertility, women who, because of how they are punished by the workplace, if they have children in their 20s and early 30s, want to delay having a child. To me, there is no justifiable reason why that shouldn't be a service on the NHS. And it's not lost on me that it's a service that is disproportionately required by women and queer people that gets shelved as something that should obviously, you know, be private and the private providers that are providing it cheaply are somehow the good guys. We should be, a Labour government should be advocating for increased integration of services like dental, eye care, reproductive health care, mental health care, social care. A Labour party that's worth its salt should be in encouraging and fighting for the reintegration of those services into the NHS, rather than literally representing the interests of those who are benefiting from the increasing um, fragmentation of our healthcare system into private, semi-private and publicly owned. So to me, this goes so much further than just one man and his company. It represents a complete capitulation um, of the conser- of the Labour Party into conservative principles that ultimately working class people should get the bare minimum when it comes to public health care services. And they have adjudicated that, you know, reproductive justice, reproductive health care is not considered to be essential. Um, people, the people who need it don't matter as much. Um, and so for no good reason, they have, you know, picked it off and put it out of the NHS. We should be fighting for that reintegration rather than electing and supporting people who are benefiting from that fragmentation. It was never on the NHS. I mean, I, it seems that there's two issues here, isn't there? One, should the NHS provide egg freezing services to everyone? Yes. Is the reason it's not because some companies have gone and provided it anyway? I would say probably not. So that's, that to me seems like if, if, if the option that the public are getting is either paying some, you know, a, a company which is offered low cost egg freezing or no one offering egg freezing, then it seems strange to demonize the company who's offering some, some egg freezing. It might create a conflict of interest. I'm totally with you on there. But I think it seems a bit odd to say to have started this company in the first place is, is a bad thing. Do you want a quick response before we wrap up? For me, it's not about a, an assessment of Prafal Nagan's morality. It's about saying, who are we electing into positions of political decision making? Whether or not I think that your company in the conditions that we are in have done something good does not change the fact that you are exploiting something that is politically broken about our system. And therefore, why should I have any faith that you would be invested in changing that, especially when he is part of a wave of the Labour Party that is deeply uncommitted to a public NHS. Because you're right, the IVF has never been available on the NHS. And to me, I think that that is, you know, systemic misogyny and systemic homophobia and queerphobia that is the reason why this is seen as an elective healthcare process. 
But the fact that we are, that we see it appropriate to elect as a politician, I'm not, this isn't about whether or not this guy has made good decisions in his life or whether he's a good guy or a bad guy. This is about what are the political and class interests that should be elected and represented as part of a Labour Party. And to me, someone who is making a stinking profit off of, you know, the fact that we don't have fully available reproductive health care, that to me is not, you know, that to me is not someone that represents the political interests of a Labour Party worth their salt. I agree. I think the, the issue here is the potential um, conflict of interest. I think some people can get IVF on the, on the NHS. I'm not entirely sure. I, I just looked up egg freezing, which is that um, you can only get it if you've had sort of some kind of medical reason why you, you might not become infertile. Whereas I think increasingly people are going to want to start freezing their eggs because they're not sure if they want to have a baby until they're, say, 40, for example. Um Dahlia, it's been a very interesting show. Uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night for our election live stream. Uh, make sure you're well rested before that. I will be asleep from now until then, sleeping off the last of the Glastonbury feelings. <laughs> um, you can read the rest of Navarro Media's articles on NavarroMedia.com, including um, details of how the Nargans were pretty good um, at maximising their tax efficiencies. Um, we will not be back um, tomorrow night for another live stream from 6pm. Um, there won't be a Navarra Live as usual tomorrow. That's because um, we're saving ourselves for our multi-hour uh, election sesh, which will be live from 9.30. So do make sure you're, you're comfortable, you've got your snacks ready, because you're going to be tuning in with Navarra Media for the long haul from 9.30. Of course, remember to vote, all, all, the, all the other things. Uh, vote with your conscience. I think you probably can in this election. Um, and thank you again for watching. You've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.